Why would you go to Cuba, my uncle would have said. Because they've decided to replace centralized state command socialism with cooperatives. We had been thinking about the development of cooperatives under capitalism as one way people can resist periodic crises. So when we heard that cooperatives were also being developed in Cuba, we wanted to understand how they were doing it and how it would help their society in the face of both the embargo and internal policy errors. Not that there were any. Okay, there were some. Agricultural cooperatives date back to 1879 in Cuba. After the revolution in 1959, the new government encouraged their growth. They have consistently had higher yields than state-run farms. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91, the state encouraged the growth and development of agricultural co-ops even more. The Cuban economy has never quite recovered from the effects of the collapse of the Soviet Union, its major benefactor for 30 years. And now, its second benefactor, Venezuela, is endangered. Meanwhile, the two major sources of hard currency are now tourism and export of medical supplies and expertise. With 84% of the workforce employed by the state, there's overstaffing and low worker motivation. The government leadership has been coming to terms with inefficiency and a financially unsustainable situation. Close to half a million workers are being laid off, and to deal with that, Cuba is opening up to small private enterprise, beauty parlors, restaurants, repair shops, and more. The decision was also made to substitute worker-managed cooperatives for state-run enterprises as one way to maintain emphasis on socialist values and practices. These co-ops can replace passive participation under centralized state socialism with the proactive involvement that is better suited to democratic socialism. In 2011, the 6th Cuban Communist Party Congress approved economic reform goals called the Guidelines on Economic and Social Policy for the Party and the Revolution, commonly referred to as the Lineamientos. The guidelines consist of 313 points, which I will now enumerate. Or maybe for now, just this one. Dramatically increase non-state sector employment of the labor force. That means allow small businesses and cooperatives. The new provisional law offers incentives to cooperatives. They get tax breaks, they can buy supplies from the state wholesale, they get priority in leasing state-owned property, and they get access to credit from the state bank. A final cooperative law based on successes and challenges experienced up to that point is due to be enacted in 2016. As of the middle of 2014, 498 worker cooperatives had been approved. 384 of them are conversions from state-owned enterprises and 114 are based on proposals from small groups of entrepreneurs who want to develop worker-owned rather than boss-owned businesses. The new endorsement of cooperatives is not intended as a move toward capitalism or an abandonment of socialist principles. Rather, it's part of an effort to update the Cuban economy, part of Raul Castro's pragmatic reforms. This reform requires letting go of centralized controls. Already, more independent functioning has led to more productivity and to increased initiative by the members of the cooperatives. In theory, by making decisions democratically at their workplace, people change their way of thinking from a sense of entitlement with little participation to much more enthusiastic involvement in the growth and development of the economy. The cooperatives we visited were the garment factory, a bottling plant for agricultural products, a bamboo furniture and craft workshop, a ceramics workshop, an herbal medicine production plant, a bus company, a construction cooperative, and three restaurants. Cooperative workers have increased their incomes, often earning three times what they did in state-run enterprises. And many workers we spoke with recognized that cooperatives brought more than higher pay. Co-ops combine material and moral incentives, linking individual and collective interests. At the garment factory, for example, we were told, as a co-op, we are owners of our own destiny. We expect that here in the United States any time now. At most of the co-ops, we met with folks who talked about the importance of social responsibility 
in the cooperative endeavor. At the canning plant, 10% of their profit is given to the local daycare and senior centers. At the construction cooperative, along with providing preservation and reconstruction services, they promote aspiring young artisans and restorers of stained glass, murals, and furniture. According to everyone who ever said anything about cooperatives, they must implement, among other things, democratic member control, member economic participation, education and training, concern for community, autonomy and independence. Beyond their local communities, there is a sense of responsibility to the environment as a whole. At the herbal medicine enterprise, we heard that in the face of the collapse of the Soviet Union 25 years ago, which led to the loss of 90% of Cuba's imports, including medicines, Cuba found the solution by expanding production of natural medicines made from plants that grow in Cuba. These are used to treat everything from diarrhea to the common cold. Prescriptions for alternative medicine are taught in the Cuban medical schools and are provided in pharmacies alongside Western pharmaceuticals. Some critics say Cubans aren't interested in alternative treatments, but then as World Council of Churches official and National Assembly member Dr. Ophelia Ortega says, it takes a long time to change a mentality. At the bottling plant named Si Se Puede, currently being sued by Dolores Huerta, Barack Obama, and a cooperative cleaning company in Brooklyn for copyright infringement, the president of the co-op told us that the bottles they use are collected by people contracted by the state, and that leads to the bottleneck in their production process, trouble finding bottle caps and corks to fit the various bottlenecks. Cooperatives are now seen by the government as a key element in overall economic reforms. Cuban economist Camila Pinheiro Harnecker, in the preface to the recently released book Cooperatives and Socialism in Cuba, which she edited, says, The value of the cooperative lies in the social relations of production that are established among its members, relations between associated producers rather than between wage workers and capitalists. There are no bosses and subordinates in a cooperative, but an organizational structure and a technical division of labor that have been collectively drawn up and approved. She writes that co-ops, quote, promote the advancement of democratic values, attitudes, and habits, unquote. With the growth of co-ops, these values can thrive much more than they did under a more bureaucratic state socialist economic system, unless unless the people are too worn down by embargo and a bureaucratized system, too tired and even hungry, and no one can figure out how to flush the bureaucracy out so that people can be mobilized into the next act of this grand drama, and this time, direct the play themselves. Beyond taxation and loan policies, the state is promoting cooperatives by relaxing administrative control over businesses. This way, workers are more likely to develop the skills of participatory democracy where they work. But people need training in cooperativism, in techniques of planning, accounting, and human resource management specific to working in a cooperative. So far, there is not a locally organized or centralized way to make sure that's happening in all the new co-ops. So on the one hand, there's definitely a commitment but on the other hand, the state is not doing all it could to make cooperatives happen and thrive on a large scale. There are national and international organizations working on this way of organizing economic enterprises, and delegations have come to teach as well as to learn from the cooperatives in Cuba. Cubans can learn a great deal from the research and analysis done about the long-standing co-op movements in Spain, Canada, Scotland, Argentina, Venezuela, and even in the U.S. Democratically self-governing cooperatives are an essential feature of progressive anti-capitalist organizing, both here in the U.S. and in Cuba. Cuba may be laying the foundation for a significant part of its economy being cooperatively run. Shortages of raw materials, parts, and technology will continue to be the norm as long as the U.S. blockade is in place. When those restrictions are lifted, it's possible there will be dramatic change in many areas of Cuban life. 
cooperatives can act as a buffer against the growth of a capitalist class that profits from the exploitation of its workers. Cooperation and workplace democracy can help socialism grow and continue to evolve. The alternative is not acceptable. The next phase of U.S. left solidarity with Cuba should include taking responsibility to mobilize whatever resources we can to help Cubans resist the attempt of their northern neighbor to subvert from within the values that we all stand for. Participatory democracy and socialism. What more could anyone ask for?